Hey everyone, I'm super thrilled to be interviewing the incredible Carly Finlay today. Carly is the author of the amazing memoir, Say Hello. She is an amazing appearance advocate as well as being a fabulous advocate for people with chronic illness, disability, and basically everyone who is treated unfairly or lacking access to basic human rights that a lot of people don't even think about, like access into buildings with stairs and community events. She is just an incredible person and one of my literary and advocacy heroes. Mm -hmm. I believe that Carly is an inspirational <laughs> author because of all the reasons I mentioned, plus her amazing book, Say Hello, is <laughs> beautiful and moving. It helped me learn a lot about day-to-day -day life of ichthyosis and it challenges people's assumptions about the lives of people with visibly different appearances. I love this book. We need better representation in our literature and on TV too. And I think this book goes a long way for helping that. Carly, thank you. Such you. Grew <laughs> oh, that was really nice. I'm fangirling because I really love your Instagram and YouTube. Oh, I'm fangirling too. You're one of my literary. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you ready to get started? I'm ready to get started. First question is totally unrelated to your amazing work. You post a <laughs> lot of delicious pictures of comfort food on social media and I love all mm -hmm. of them. <laughs> if you could only eat two foods for the rest Ooh. of your life, what would they have to be? Do they have to be fruit? They can be... Or, fruit or fruits? They can be anything. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Okay, I would eat mac and cheese. That is one food because they come together <laughs> as a meal and the other bit would be cheese. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, it wouldn't be craft cheese, like it wouldn't be craft singles or anything that is fake cheese. Um, it would be like camembert or gouda or hibachi or any cheese that's amazing, delicious. I love camembert. Oh. Me too. Oh my gosh, have you tried baked camembert? Oh no, I've been wanting to though. Yeah, try it. It's very good with, with a bit of jam. I think you can use like um onion jam or probably fruit jams if you want to. It's That's very good. Nice. Yeah, I've nearly completed 10 weeks of our dairy. So as soon as I finish that, I'm gonna I'm definitely going to try baked camembert. That sounds amazing. Yeah, good. That's amazing. Let me know how you go. Now onto your book. Say Hello is such an incredible book. I love it. It's very personal. Did you find it difficult or rather cathartic to write? Oh, it was a bit of both. Yeah, I've been writing for a long time, um, all my life, and I've been writing a blog specifically, which led to media work before I wrote Say Hello. And then I thought that writing Say Hello was a little bit like going to be like writing a blog. I thought I'd be able to write a bunch of separate things and then put them together. And it wasn't quite like that. Um, it was not, I didn't find it very enjoyable. I quite like writing. I like the feel of it. I don't know about you, but I like the flow that you feel when it's a bit of a rush, I guess, when you're in the flow. And I like the outcome of having something on the page after having nothing on the page. But I found writing the blog, the book really hard because there was a deadline. Um, it was lots of pressure. It was lots of um, like pressure from myself to do good and also pressure. One of the hard things I found was there was pressure from other disabled people not to fail. Um, that was hard and whether that that pressure was intentional or not that pressure was there so i found that really hard and um a little bit of the time i experienced when as i was writing the book and particularly now i experienced a lot of bullying from within the disability community and i found that really hard because i worried that writing the book would just cause more bullying and i mean it has to an extent but then I get messages from people to tell them to tell me how much the books help them or how they've enjoyed it or their how, how they've made a, um like a realization about their own skin condition i think those messages mean the most to me yeah that's that's not okay we should definitely support each other like absolutely 
like why are people in the disability community do that that's that's horrible i mean i think everyone's different and everyone has their own experience of disability and their own way of telling their story but um yeah for me it had been because i you know supposedly sold out to a mainstream publisher and they didn't like that but disabled people are fighting for representation in the mainstream and fighting for work and pay and i have all that and anyway i don't know it's very very confusing yeah i i really want my book mainstream but that's a bit of a difficult thing really is it yeah i i i would need to rewrite it because i published it and i'm like that's like i don't want to deal with right now <laughs> i don't want to yeah, right. maybe maybe your second book can be mainstream yeah that's what i'm hoping for yeah well you know you've got a track record of publishing so publishers want to see and you've also got an online presence which is great <laughs> yeah and i have another pitch book coming on i've got a lot of projects i, I take on too many projects at the same time it's, i have i have a very weird complicated process in my brain <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned some of your friends and family in this book how has mm -hmm. everyone felt about it have there been a lot of positive feedback yeah yeah it's been pretty nice my mum my mum is known as festival mum now she came on lots of festival events with me um she loves it and she i think i reckon she's always got a copy on her to tell people <laughs> <laughs> and um she came to bali with me last year and we uh i went to ubud writers festival so bali wasn't a place that i would normally choose to go it's very hot and humid and doesn't really suit my skin but i thought this was a once in a lifetime opportunity like what an amazing it was a working holiday for me um you know i i had to work there i don't know i think i did four events in ubud and then i did another or in um, Java and then the rest of the time I got to eat and got to hang out with people and it was really fun but my mum was um, my mum was there and she flew in on a different day to me or maybe on the same day but we flew in differently anyway she came to meet me the first day and she had all my books I had to I had to take my books over it, it's weird um, in Bali for the writers festival international writers often have to take their books over if the publisher um isn't able to send them for some reason that didn't happen so i had to take my books over and she hi my queen is here um she had um no that's okay vanessa hi um she had come in she had come with half of the books to give to me at the hotel and there was a shop across the road like a dress shop and she saw this Australian woman and she said oh, hi my daughter's at the writers festival and she sold this book in the dress shop to this woman which is quite funny uh, so she's like my biggest supporter um, everybody that I have spoken to um, likes it it's funny because I feel like you get as a writer as an online writer you get a lot of pushback online with people telling you that they don't like your writing or whatever but no one has sort of written to me to tell me how awful it is so that's a good thing sometimes they might say they disagree with how i'll do something or say something and, and that's okay um but yeah the majority of people i know really love it which is nice and um the response has been great i found it one of the things i did find hard was um la when i wrote the book uh it, it, i finished the writing in november november of 2018 and in January 2018, one of my best friends um, was diagnosed with cancer and she died early last year and she's featured in the book. And when I had to read her bit that she wrote for me, her name is Camille, when I had to read her bit she um, wrote, I found that really hard because she hadn't died yet, but I knew, you know, that, that it was coming. And that was hard. I'll show you, Camille. Um, and I found that hard and then we did some media last year with the ABC and I did ABC 730 with my mum which was really fun and they uh, showed this photo as well on there. I don't know whether you can see but that's a wedding photo and Camille's in the pink. Aww. And she made Camille and Cassie's dresses. Um, so that was, yeah, that was hard like knowing that, you know, <laughs> she's not here anymore and having to 
narrate that bit. Um, but yeah, it's been lovely. And I get so many messages of people telling me, I had two this morning actually on Instagram to say I've read the book and have, it's helped me and, um, you know, from strangers and from friends. Yeah, it's really, it's been really nice. And the positives have outweighed the negatives. I know I said earlier that the bullying was really hard. That was even before the book came out, but the positives have definitely, definitely outweighed. One thing, my husband has not read all of the book. <laughs> yes, we're still married, but he's, I think he's only kind of read up to about, I think he's, I don't think he's read his chapter yet. Um, he's a very slow reader and he did say that he did say that if I wrote about Star Wars he might have read it quicker <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome yeah my mum's my biggest supporter too yeah it's so good your mum and my mum should become like festival mum groupies yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's incredible though and I'm, I'm sure Camille would have loved it would have loved the book yeah well she was the first to order it so oh. when you write a book and it gets published um by a publisher you get a you get a link to um the pre-order so generally the publishers well my publisher wanted me to um sort of pre-order through booktopia i think but it was available everywhere but booktopia was the place that they could pre-order from and then i got um oh, what's it called i can't remember a, a, a um affiliate link so when people buy it i get some money uh, which is great and then all of those orders go towards a signing and then i had to go to a booktopia and sign it anyway that happened like i think in october before uh january when the book came out and she was wanted to be the first one that bought it um i think it was like on sale late early one morning but she bought it the night before and she's like yeah i'm the first one and she was she came to the launch which is really lovely and yeah it was really nice to have her involved where she, where she could be so oh, and also um she was involved in the making of the cover the cover kind of looked like that first but the publisher wanted to have a different photo which she'd taken years ago and because the photo was taken on such an old camera like in 2010 or something the camera was too the pixels were too small and so then they asked her to redo it so we did we had a fun photo shoot and some of the images that i use for my stock photo you know for my author profile photo i have those from camille and they weren't used but she got paid and then there was that um that cover so she was involved in the making of the cover and on the blo on my blog I, I did write a little thing about that i'll send it on if you like oh that's amazing yeah. <laughs> Chapter 13 is definitely your most blunt chapter and <laughs> one of my favourites um, <laughs> because I can totally relate as I'm gender fluid so I get a lot of the weird questions about sex and genitals. It's just, it blows my mind that anyone possibly think that they have a right to ask that about someone. Do mm, people, absolutely. Do people still actually ask you about this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think they do now. I think so. A couple of years ago for context i had a really difficult radio interview with a melbourne presenter and before that interview i was i was talking to a friend about it recently before that interview i had an interview with another difficult radio interviewer and i knew that um that this the first one was difficult so i had got danielle my agent to write a letter to the producer and she had written a really great letter to say uh, Carly is coming in. Uh, she's talking about the Emerging Writers Festival. These are the things that she doesn't want to be asked. So I really wanted to talk about writing, and I didn't want to have to say, "Well, I'm on the radio because I have ichthyosis," or um, you know, I, anything that wasn't relevant to the Writers Festival. The funny thing was, he respected that. This interviewer respected that. But then a friend of mine was there as well. We were both talking about the festival. She has an invisible disability, and she got asked all the questions that I didn't get asked. So that was difficult. Really weird. Anyway, none of them was as bad as the interview that I had in 2018, though, because this one I thought, you know, he'd been on air for years he's a very seasoned broadcaster i think at that time he'd been on air for 21 years um and i remember going to an event before that the night before that 
and I had seen his producer, his ex producer, and I said, oh, I was, I had a few, I had a, I was a drinks event, and I had a few drinks, and I said to his producer, oh, I'm really nervous about going on the show, and they said, oh, he'll be fine, he'll be fine. He said he'll probably just call you a snowflake, and I'm like, oh God, you know, here you go. And I remember getting in there and not preparing. He didn't know who I was either, and that was weird to me. I don't consider myself famous, although I know I have a profile, but. I've also worked on the ABC a lot. Like I was a regular guest on ABC Melbourne with Claire Bowditch um, and also the pre presenter after her. And I was on You Can't Ask That and I'd written for the ABC and I had done interviews, you know, countless interviews for different shows and he didn't know who I was. I'd also written for The Age in Melbourne, you know, our newspaper here. And I was really surprised and then he asked me uh, this, these really inappropriate questions. And it, and it was funny because I was there to talk about inappropriate questions. So he demonstrated what I was talking about. Um, but now when I do interviews in the media, I think because that interview made national news, it, I was on the project talking about it and I did an article in The Age and have talked about it a little since. I think journalists are really scared <laughs> in case they do the wrong thing. And I did an interview with somebody who's known as quite a difficult um, presenter after that for my book tour and it was very good i was expecting similar but it was very good and um they actually let me vet the interview before it went to air uh so i think that there's that there's that but there's also strangers as well you know strangers are just a different beast and you never know what's going to come out of their mouth as you yeah. might get and but since that interview i think because i've spoken about the inappropriateness of this so much it hasn't been an issue too much but it has been a weird it's a weird thing it's a weird uh, thing because so it's like it's different if you lead the conversation about that it's different if you lead the conversation about your own body or joke about you know and I think back to the time when I might have talked about my boobs or you know, something cheeky in a cheeky way. And it's very different me leading the conversation to an old white male presenter leading a conversation, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard. And, and I think, well, you know, should I, have, should I have spoken up in the interview? I didn't really. I was just so shocked that it even happened because it was all live. So I guess my book response was, um, was that it was chapter 13. Yeah. I think I think it's it's good that people aren't doing it as much nowadays. Well, that's horrible that those presenters were doing that. They should be focusing on your amazing talents. No, you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the issue though. When when you are a diverse person or a person that's not straight white, cisgendered, non-disabled, I think people have the they feel like they've got the right to question you and they've got the right to you know, intrude and, and you're like an object of curiosity. Um, it's, it's weird. It's, it's a weird thing. And, and, I, and I think back as well to the times when I've been curious about people's bodies in the way they've been curious about mine. And while I haven't overtly asked, there's, you know, there, there's sort of stares I've given or, you know, thoughts I've had that I thought, oh gosh, I shouldn't be thinking that because that makes me behave the same way that I don't like. Yeah, I, I, I don't like when people are like thinking that they have this right to ask this question because it's like, hold on, get to know me first, and then we'll see. I <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, when it's the first thing that people ask me, I did an interview last week. Oh, this was an in interesting thing. I did an interview last week with a Malaysian radio station. I don't know how they found me, but they were doing a segment on skin conditions all week, so I was one of their interviewers, interviewees, and. It was very odd because I, I had to sort of set them straight. Like I had to say, your questions are quite intrusive. And I just like, I, I have to answer these questions about my appearance, but you don't. Like I kind of put it back on them. And I think they must have thought I was a bit snippy, but I didn't want to have to. It's, it's hard because I know that I've written a book about my appearance, but also I, I, sometimes I want to talk about the writing or sometimes I want to talk about ableism. I shouldn't have to be the thing that demonstrates the ableism. Yeah, good on you because, yeah, <laughs> if not, yeah, I don't like when people do that. It's, it's horrible. It is. 
you are the editor of Growing Up Disabled, which will be mm-hmm. released early next year. Did you get a copy already? Oh, I pre-ordered it, and I'm, I'm <laughs> waiting I, for it. I'm like, because I put you on, I put your name on the media list. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how many pre, like pre copies they had. So you might not have got one, but I definitely put your name on on for for media next year. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. How do you celebrate when it finally comes out? It's such an amazing. Oh, it's, it's been a long time. Um, I'm so excited. So growing up disabled, here it is. Um, every time I do an interview, I put my books next to me so I can grab them. Um, this is the, this is the um pre i don't know the copy that isn't quite correct the uncorrected proof it, and it's i think it's gonna that there's gonna have a few changes in there um so uh, growing up disabled it's the fifth book in the growing up series of black ink books growing up series um and it's got over 40 different people in there some interviews some graphic art some poetry and some stories Uh, I'm really, really excited. I'm so happy that all these people get a platform, a published platform to, you know, show off their writing. Um, It's been a really long time. Like publishing takes ages. And I got my, got the Growing Up Disabled book deal in 2018, which was, so a year, nearly a year to the day that I got the Say Hello book deal, nearly. Yeah, about about ten months between getting the ten months, no, fourteen months. Uh, I got the say hello book deal in May two thousand and seventeen, and I got the growing up disabled in July, I think, or August two thousand and eighteen. So not long, um, but <laughs> it's taken so long. We had this really long embargo. Um, so we weren't allowed to tell anyone about it for like five months. So from July to December. So we launched the, (laughs) we launched the call out in December and we, um, had like a six month period, I think, of people writing in lots of people, 366 people. And I know that you were one of them. Yeah. I, I (laughs) kind of glad and get in because I, I had like two days to write and I was like rushing oh, in. Oh really? And I was like, I, um, this is horrible. <laughs> Still going to submit it. I really enjoyed your story, but it was very hard to choose out of 366 people. So yeah. there will be lots of other opportunities for you, I promise. Um, yeah, and it was really, we got an amazing amount of people that wrote in and then um, there was, you know, like I, I got to read them, which was amazing. And the editing process was really, was quite quick actually, like the, the kind of overall editing process. I read every one of them and made like short lists of those. And then uh, that, that took about two months, two and a half months. It was from about August to October. And um, I had to see where there are gaps. So where there were like people, like, types of disabilities that weren't represented or people that I really wanted. So for example, um, I really wanted to get a Paralympian and I had someone in mind and I asked them if they could do an interview. So we did. And that was Isis Holt. Isis is still growing up. Isis is about 18 or 19. So that's really amazing. And also uh, Jordan Steele John, he did an interview. Um, he didn't do an interview with me. He did an interview with someone else. So um, that will be used. The whole interview will be used somewhere else. But for the book, he did that interview. Um, and I also interviewed um, a woman called Jane Rosengrave, who has an intellectual disability and work, does amazing work in um, speaking out about institutions. So she'd grown up in a lot of institutions in her life and wasn't treated very well. And so she's an incredible activist and her story is, it's very hard to read, but she's amazing. Um, And then, yeah, there were a few other people that we thought, um, you know, I'd seen pieces of writing elsewhere and said, hey, I really like your piece. Can we put it in? And it's just come together. But then COVID came and we had to put it off. But that's a good thing because we weren't, wouldn't have been able to have a book launch in the, you know, in real life. We wouldn't have been able to meet with the um, authors and meet the readers. And obviously disabled people are quite 
susceptible to COVID. So we really just want to celebrate in a way that we can. Fingers crossed we can um, in February when it's out. I'm really excited. One of the really exciting things I'm going to do to celebrate is, well, I don't know whether it's a thing that can be celebrated, but we talked a bit about the media before and I really want to give the authors, the contributors, a good media experience. So at the moment, I'm developing a media pack for the contributors. Um, and they will be able to go through it and prepare. So they'll be able to, you know, develop their elevator pitch to talk about their book really quickly. They'll be able to know how to deal with sometimes intrusive comments after writing a story, you know. Um, I remember being at a book launch last year where I talked all about not wanting a cure and a man came up to me and said, hey, you know, I've got some essential oils. And I said, well, I just want to sell my book. Um, anyway, he actually bought my book, which was nice. <laughs> uh, so I think that would be really good to prep them for the media and also prep the media. I've got, a, I've got a cheat sheet for the media as well in how to talk about the book. So I'm really excited about that. That's incredible. <laughs> I'm yeah. so excited for it. It's gonna be incredible. I can't wait. I can't wait, it'd be very good. I've got a meeting about it tomorrow as well. So things are happening. Mm. If there was one thing you wish people knew about ichthyosis, what would it be? Uh, oh, that. My skin renews really fast and it means I don't look very old. I don't look as old as I am. And, and so I had, a, I had got invited to my school reunion like a few years ago for some, I think it, it wasn't even the 20 year, it's a 19 year reunion. I don't even know why it's a 19 reunion. But anyway, the bullies invited me to the school reunion. <laughs> and it was hideous because they added me to a Facebook group. And um, just like school, they just didn't speak to me. So what I did was I found a photo of me like 20 years ago and I put it next to me in present day, in 2018 day. And I, <laughs> it wasn't very nice of me, but it was pretty funny. I put it in the group and I said, oh, I just came across this photo of me from 1998. Um, I'd love to see what you look like now. And then I left the group. <laughs> uh, so I look really young. That's a really good thing. The skin renews really quickly. Although Adam said the other night that he's like, look at your forehead wrinkles. He's never noticed them before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look a bit younger than I do too because of EDS. So. Oh, because of the collagen. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky. Wow you'll be in the youth club like me. I haven't, I haven't been asked for ID for some time though, so I don't think I look that young anymore. <laughs> if you were invited to strut yourself down a walk, a catwalk in Paris, what would you want to wear? <laughs> oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think something, <laughs> I know it's a bit daggy, but something warm. I get so cold and if I had to wear like, <laughs> anything that was strapless and backless that wouldn't be good um but i would like to wear something really glamorous as well so probably like um i don't know something that has sleeves <laughs> that i can wear leggings underneath but very glamorous is that is that a good answer i don't know um i have been down the catwalk a couple of times at melbourne fashion week for access to fashion that i organize a Few years ago, and then the, and then the next week, I work at Melbourne Fringe, and the next week they wanted like um, minor celebrities to be involved in a fashion show, and they're like, "Carly, do you want to come?" And these kids, this is funny. These kids got to design clothes with um, RMIT students, I think, and I got to wear a dress that had a cat inside it, <laughs> and so it was like. Uh, a dress that had two layers like a see-through layer and then a cat inside the see-through layer and i got to be with my boss and he had this funny thing that had all like um tubes coming out of his head <laughs> that sounds awesome i don't want to wear that dress again but it was pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> so that was a good question i'll get planning on what i'm going to wear for for um uh paris fashion week some of my friends were in new york fashion week this week 
Oh, yeah. Um, some Australian disabled people were in the runway of dreams, which is great, and American ones too. It was really great. I was a bit sad that I wasn't there, but it was very good to see them there. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Now we're on to the speed questions. <laughs> what are you writing at the moment? Uh, that uh, that document on how to how to promote the book. I'm writing that. I'm also writing a piece. I guess it's in response to the bullies about how I don't know. Like we just there's enough space in the world for everybody, and that you know by me doing what I'm doing doesn't stop them doing what they're doing. Oh, the other thing I'm writing, which is exciting, is I did an interview with I did a few interviews with a bunch of people for Disability Day, and so Disability Day is in December. And I was asked to interview some people who were disabled. I could pick them. And I picked a whole heap that I hadn't talked to before. So I got to interview, actually, pardon me. Actually, that's a lie. There was one person I had talked to before. But I'm in, I've interviewed a disabled um, fashion designer. She's the first blind fashion designer in the world, I think, maybe, in Australia, in the world. So she's blind. Um, I also interviewed a doctor. He is the first quadriplegic to qualify in Queensland and the second in Australia. And I also interviewed a musician who is the daughter of a very famous musician um, and a musician in her own right. And I will interview an Aboriginal activist next week. So I'm really excited to, yeah, to write those it's interviews amazing. up into stories. Yeah. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Ice cream. Oh yes, this is a good question. Um, I really like like mango sorbet, oh. like mango gelati or mango, yeah, mango gelati, not sorbet. Yes. Yes. And lemon as well. Gosh, there's so many. I know. <laughs> there's so many amazing flavours. I can't. I just... Maybe your next festival could be like, I don't know, ice cream festival. Yes. Yes. I love Making that. ice cream. <laughs> Which character do you or have you had a crush on? Oh, hmm. I don't know. I, can't. I, I mean, I, I really like, like I had a, a girl crush on um, Matilda. I really liked her and her book ethic and just the, I don't know, human rights activist she is. Um, I don't know. Oh, yes. Claudia Kishi's wardrobe. From the Babysitter's Club, right? Uh -huh. Claudia Kishi. <laughs> um, did you watch the new Babysitter's Club? No, I haven't. Oh my God, it's so good. It's so good. Watch it, please. And then tell me about it. It's so good. There's like, um, there's a really great trans storyline in there. The fashion is amazing. And also, I bought, I bought one of Claudia Kishi's dresses that she wore on the, on the show. It was really expensive and then it didn't fit. <laughs> but I think I might have to get it made into a top. The, the sizing was weird. I don't, I, that is a designer that, um, like a, probably a designer that was on pa Paris runway. But I think I might have to get it made into a top um, because it's a very weird proportion. It fits me up top, but does not fit me down bottom. But I, yeah, anyway, watch it. It's amazing. Uh, it was so great. You, you need to see it. <laughs> Except I didn't like that there was a scene at the end with um, that had a bit about facial differences. It, that wasn't good. But also, another show, sorry to di divert, but <laughs> Mallory, Mallory Towers. Have you been watching Mallory Towers? No, I haven't. Oh, well, that's got a character with a facial difference in it, and they don't even mention it, and it's so great. It's just amazing. I love that. Yes. Yep. That's on ABC iView, and um, Babysitters is on Netflix. What was your worst subject in school? <laughs> Maths? No, maybe PE. Oh, I don't like PE either. <laughs> Who was your favourite or most inspirational author? Ooh. Um, oh, gosh. So many of them. I really loved Danielle Binks's book. I know that is a bit of a conflict of interest given she's my agent, but her book, The Year the Maps Changed, was probably my favourite this year. Um, and in terms of like authors that have just changed my life, one of the books that I've read 
um, when did I read it? I probably read it in about 2010, maybe 2011. And I studied it then, uh, like I used it for study purposes in 2012, was a book by a woman called Jenny Morris called Pride Against Prejudice. And Stella Young, who was a disability activist um, who died in 2014, she recommended that I read it. And I read it and it was incredible. It articulated all the stuff that I didn't really know how to say about disability and about ableism and Jenny um, wrote about how it's other people who whose expectations they place onto you other things that bring you down and she really articulated the ableism and she interviewed a bunch of people it's a book from the 90s or maybe even the 80s it's very hard to get now but she's on twitter so i got to talk to her about it which was really lovely and um it was just so great so i'd say that she's probably been one of my most influential writers and not reading ebooks or hard books oh i when i saw this question i thought yes this is this is my question so i have like <laughs> probably 200 books piled up onto a bookshelf that don't fit on my bookshelf and one day when i was working <laughs> they all fell down and i had this big crash and adam was in the bedroom and they were like everywhere all over anyway that's because i don't really read paperbacks very quickly um i like audiobooks so <laughs> i often download the kindle whisper sync thing and read audiobooks that way or on um, the audible app depending um so i like audiobooks the best but i do read paperbacks as well i don't tend to read ebooks unless i'm on the plane so i i do have the ebook version of things but i don't tend to read it unless i don't have a book to take and i just got my ipad and read it that way so yeah toss up between audio and paper I love audiobooks, like getting immersed in it is just, yeah, especially when it's narrated really well and, you know, there are different actors doing it. What is the weirdest place or thing you've got inspiration from for your writing? Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like some of the things that people have said to me, like the ableist stuff, you know, it's an opportunity. Sometimes, you know, you think, oh God, why, you know, why this has happened? But it's like, oh, great. You know, here's some content. Um, I don't know. I can't, I can't really think. I guess for me, I've spent so much time writing about my own experience or disability that it becomes a bit tiring and I want to write about something fun and something um, that's not about disability. And one of the questions that was asked last year at the Albert Writers Festival, I did a panel on feminist writing. Maeve Marston said, if there's a topic that you could write on that's not about the, you know, like um, the activism that you do, what would it be? And mine was like, I really want to write an article on Savage Garden because I love them so much. And I did. Uh, after that, it was their 20 year anniversary of their album Affirmation last year. And so I pitched it to an, a media outlet and I published it. So I had written, so that was nice to write. I mean, not a weird inspiration, but just a, a goal that I had to write about it. And then Darren thanked me for the story. So that was nice. Yeah, that was, that was good. I'm going to read that. <laughs> Do you remember the first book you've read, or if not, your favourite childhood book that you love to read? Yeah, the first book that I would have read would have been um, at the end of at the end of preschool and kinder. We all got a book, and like I think at the end of preschool, I got Grug, Grug and the Rainbow, wow. and also um, I got Jemima Puddle Duck at the end of kinder. I remember that and. One of the things that I just got in the mail this week, I don't know whether you saw it on Instagram, but it was a brooch, a Meg and Mog brooch. You remember Meg and Mog, the children's picture book about the witch and the cat? Oh, I think so I really like those kinds of picture books, um, you know, and so I got a brooch that replicated Meg and Mog. So yeah, and I would say that though, you know, while I don't really remember what happened in Grug and the Rainbow, <laughs> that was the first kind of book that I, remember um and also you know as i said before i i read all those books like um you know paul jennings 
Maurice Gleitzman. I really liked Gretel Colleen's books and Margaret, Ma I don't know whether she's a New Zealand author, Margaret Mahi, Mahi? M-A-H-Y. I really liked her books. I used to go to the mobile library a lot and borrow them and the Babysitter's Club books. So, yeah, kids' books are the best. <laughs> what do you see as your biggest achievement so far in life? Ooh, um, there's a few, but I think it might be, I'm sorry, this is a bit, I don't know, is it a bit cliche, but maybe like feeling good and in, like liking myself despite despite what other people think maybe it's that um writing a book has been a pretty big achievement um having you know two on the way is pretty good um mm, to know yeah i mean i think access to fashion when i did the fashion parade which featured disabled models that was a big a big like big little workload so that was nice um yeah but i think it's about you know working on myself and being comfortable with that do you have any advice to share with young writers? Yeah, start a blog, start a social media presence. Um, publishers and agents want to see that. Just write, like write as much as you can. If you want to do it 15 minutes a day, half an hour a day, just write, have fun. Don't let it become unfun. Like when it, when it stops being fun, it's hard. I found when I started doing it for work, it's, it's harder than when I was just writing a blog here and there. Uh, and yeah, just read a lot as well. I feel like when I was a kid, I read so much and then I didn't really read much for pleasure at school because I had to do all the, you know, prescribed texts at high school. And then at uni, uni was just boring text. And I really feel like in the last sort of 10 years, I've read a lot more again, which has been really nice. So read a lot and connect with other writers. That's the fun part. Like meeting other writers or other writers are amazing. It's so supportive. They're not your competition. They're your support. Beautiful advice. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me grow you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That was fun. It was a fun interview. Make sure to check out Carla Finlay on her social media and my the book because it's fantastic. <laughs> oh, I have some news about the book. Ooh, Can I tell you? Go for it. This is <laughs> I forgot to tell you. So, you know, I'm really passionate about access and making the book accessible and making things accessible. And that was a really big thing when I was writing the book and when I was doing my book events. And it's very hard for an Australian author who writes memoir to get a book deal overseas because if you're not known overseas, then it can be, or, or if the topic isn't sort of, um, easily translated overseas even though mine is it's not you know you're generally finding it really hard to sell the book overseas anyway so the book was available in audiobook on uh all around the world i think on amazon like audible and also itunes until quite recently i mean well it's been available around the world since yeah april i think last year but that was the only way it was available around the world the other like if people wanted to buy the paperback they'd have to pay either you know fifty dollars postage uh which is huge or i was buying it they were paying it i would post it so in the end it would work about fifty dollars and uh, but it was a lot of work like i was sort of posting a heap of books at one time and it was you, you have to anyway so a friend of mine in america who's quite a high profile disabled person is deaf blind harbin germa and harbin is amazing she's written a memoir herself and she asked me how, how she could read the book. And the only way she could read the book is through an e-version, which translates through her Braille reader. And so the e-version is very hard to get overseas because of geo-blocking. So like an Australian Amazon doesn't work in America. You know, you have to have an Australian account, an Australian address. So we were talking about different ways to get it to her. She obviously couldn't read a paperback and she couldn't listen to an audio. And I emailed my publisher and I said, Harbin really wants to read this book. Um, she's quite a high profile lawyer and activist in America. What can we do? And so my publisher, Catherine at HarperCollins sent her the book and said, thank you so much for wanting to read it. Um, also, she made it available overseas in all formats 
now worldwide. And so it is now available to buy online as an ebook or as a paperback and an audio book. Um, so anyone can buy it from around the world. So that was really great, all because someone asked for accessibility. So the moral of the story is access opens up more markets. That's amazing.